Good morning and welcome to worship here with Northminster Presbyterian Church. Whether you're here in person or online streaming today, we are so glad to be worshiping together. And you know in the Bible, it says to praise God with the tambourine and with dancing. Is there anything more joyous and happy sounding an instrument and to use with dancing than a tambourine? I know it's... I know I'm embarrassing myself, but isn't that just fun? I think when God is calling us to worship, he's not just calling us into something that's dour and serious, but God is calling us into something that's exciting, that's a relationship with him of love, of adventure, and it is his spirit that meets us here today. So let us worship God with the spirit of dancing, with the tambourine, with the organ, with our voices, trusting that the Lord will meet us here. God is good. Let us worship God. daughter of Zion, shout aloud, be glad and rejoice with all your heart. The Lord our God is with us. He has taken away our punishment. He has turned back our enemy. The Lord our God is with us. He is mighty to save. He will give you, O God, honor and praise from among all the peoples of the earth. Please join me as we pray our prayer of invocation. God of glory, you sent your Son to be born in our world, to be for us the light of the world, to reveal your love for all people. Help us, Holy Spirit, to worship you now, holy three in one, Father, Son, and Spirit, May our our praise praise bring glory glory to you and exalt exalt you as our our God of life, healing, and hope. We confess that our sin and errors hide us from your light. We We turn turn away away from from the poor. We ignore cries for justice. justice. We do do not work work for peace. Show Show us us how how to live this this new year right. right. Show us how to enjoy your everlasting and new every morning hope. In your mercy, help us. Cleanse us from our sins and renew us to live in your light and to offer your love to others. Help us to be faithful in prayer, praying as you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts and debtors. forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
before you sit down and for folks who are online, uh, don't move, don't shake hands, don't hug, but turn towards each other and give an authentic wave of love and greeting. Can we do that? There we go. There we go. All right. Now you can sit down. Thank you. I'm Pastor Andy, and I've got five things I want you to know. And the first is just a word of welcome. Welcome, friends. What a joy that even in uh, difficult carefulness, uh, we can be together, either here in person or online. I want to welcome all of you. I know a lot of you regulars online have a place set apart for worship. You have your habit of getting your TV or device ready, queued up. And I do earnestly hope and pray that with us here in the sanctuary that this is a time and space set apart for all of us to gather in worship and to praise our living God for his life, forgiveness, and hope. Uh, welcome. Uh, I do want to say as a word of welcome that uh, I'd encourage you to let us know that you're with us today. Uh, you can simply text on your phone a device and it'll bring up our, our Connect card, or you'll see a QR code there in the corner. Give it a try. Hold your phone up and aim it at that QR code if you can, or there may be some in the pews, and uh, it'll bring up our I was with you all in worship today. Let us know who you are, and especially if you have a praise you're celebrating in your life or a prayer request. We'd love to know who you are. Uh, number two, I want to encourage you uh, that we're starting up a divorce care online support group. Uh, it's free, and it's starting up on Friday, January 15th. Each unit is separate, so come and join in this group as you can. You do need to register via Zoom, so write me a note. Uh, we'll get you linked up. And uh, for any going through just the emotional difficulty of that separation and a divorce, uh, this is a path of healing. Uh, number three, I just want to say um, we're going to be starting a Next Steps class uh, on Wednesday, January 27th. It's Zoom. Uh, virtual class. It's just that evening. In one class, I'll be the teacher. We're going to talk about what it means to be a Christian, to get started in discipleship, what the word Presbyterian means, uh, and if you're interested, what, it, what you do to be a member of this church. And you're welcome to come and just check in and listen and learn. Again, it's Zoom and you need to register, so write me a note if you'd like to be a part of that. Uh, next, I want to say that we're going to have our mobile food pantry from the Community Food Bank in our south parking lot uh, on Thursday, January 14th in the morning, 8 to 10. Uh, just a bunch of produce, uh, vegetables. Vegetables are produce. Vegetables and produce. Uh, and uh, just resource, and it's going to be a drive-by, you know, pick up and go, done in a in a safe way. So uh, it's a great way to get some food and share that food with others. Encourage you to come by. And then lastly, I just want to encourage you to stay engaged with us at Northminster. Uh, I often tell people much of the blessings of church is what you make it to be and how you get involved. There's a different code. <laughs> Give this a try. It should uh, bring up to your phone or device uh, the bulletin that has much more information of exciting things going on in our church that I've not shared. So I do encourage you to learn about our Bible studies, prayer groups, uh, and how to get involved in this amazing family of faith. Um, welcome, friends. I'm really excited. We have some very special uh, long-term year friends who are with us today from Durban, South Africa. I'm going to introduce to you Joe and Avril Morris, who are missionary partners of ours, uh, Jesus to the Needy, and uh, their story will inspire you. Welcome. Bless you. Thank you for having us. We're going to share a, a video presentation in the background as we're speaking, but we're going to share a couple of stories of the individuals that we were able to minister to both last year and throughout our ministry time. As the pastor said, we're Joe and Avril Morris, and we're, we're uh, in the area of South Africa ministering in, 
Eswatini and Zimbabwe as well. And our ministry is called Jesus to the Needy. And we reach out to, the, to try to begin to meet the needs that are in the communities where we are serving and be able to reach them with the gospel of Christ. And we thank you for partnering with us this year. And we have some amazing uh, stories. If we had the time, we could share pretty much all day what God has done throughout this year. Avril's going to share a story with you now. One of my favorite um, life transformation stories that we've experienced in our ministry is about a young Zimbabwe refugee. Her name is Fortunate. Now, Fortunate had paid someone to help her get across the border from Zimbabwe into South Africa because she didn't have the legal paperwork. Well, this person ended up raping her and taking all the money that she had. She did manage to get across the border, but it was on a train in a um, container. And she didn't realize when getting into this container on the train that it contained chemicals. So by the time we got to meet Fortunate, she was covered in sores from, from head to toe and in a really, really bad state. So we were able to get her into a hotel room to have a, a hot shower to try and clean her as best as possible. And then Joe started to treat her with creams and sprays and slowly she started to heal. And um, she gave her life to Christ and we gave her a Bible. And when we would go to Peter Maritzburg to the group where she was living with the other women, sometimes we would go and we didn't have enough donations, items of clothes or things to give to the whole group because there's like 15 women there. So the way that we handed them out is that we would say, does anybody have a memory verse that they want to share? And then those that shared a memory verse were given one of the donations. And um, Fortunate was always putting her hand up and always sharing a memory verse. And so she started to encourage the woman in the group and say, come on, you know, you need to study your Bibles, um, share, you know, learn memory verses, and, you know, then you can also um, get donations and grow close, closer to the Lord, which was very sweet. And she soon became um, very involved in one of the, um, the local churches. And it was just so almost, it was so amazing to see this transformation from this, this woman who was so ill and sickly to blossom and just loving the Lord and sharing with others. Um, one of the ladies that uh, we were ministering to this year, um, we had went into this home being invited to uh, bring in some food because they literally had no food and hadn't had any food for a while. So we, we went into this living room and um, there's a young woman around 22. She's in fourth stage. As soon as I looked at her, I knew she was um, in, in full-blown AIDS and about the fourth stage of it. Um, her arms were, were very uh, skeletal and you could see all of the features of her, of her face were all skeletal. Um, they had no food, so we, we told them, you know, we're going to give you some food in the name of Jesus. And we set it on the table, and the whole family began to weep because they had literally had no food for so long. And they were so touched and moved by just that simple thing of giving them something to eat. And the woman shared with us, we began to pray with her and ask how we could help. And she shared that her son, and he held up these shoes and they had worn completely through to where he was using um, like plastic uh, bags to fill the space so that he could wear those, um, those shoes. And she said, you know, I want my son to have some shoes. And she knew her time was very short. Um, once you get into that area of AIDS, even the ARVs don't help, and she knew that she was in decline. We prayed with her, and um, unfortunately, she succumbed to the disease within a few weeks. We were able to minister to her 
her mother uh, the, and her son, which were now living uh, in a very small house. Part of the house had collapsed. Um, we, were, we brought them uh, food, clothing, the necessities that they were, were missing. And this lady there that you just saw on the right-hand side, this woman, is the grandmother. She, as we were sharing these Bible stories each week, as we bring the food, um, she began to weep during one of the stories, and I asked her, why are, why are you weeping? And she said, well, I won't live long enough to be able to do all the good things I need to do to get into heaven. And I, I said, well, I said, I have some, some good news and some bad news, okay? The bad news is you'll never be able to earn your way into heaven. But here's the good news, the gospel, and that is that Jesus Christ has made a way for you and for me to enter into heaven, not because of what we do, because of the work of the cross that he did for us. And I led her to Christ, and we gave her that Bible that you saw, and she uh, is so grateful for the, the food that we bring her, and we shared how God is your provision. God is all of our providers, amen? And he is the one. And she looked to, to, to heaven and she said, she just was overcome that we, when we brought her this food. And she just said, God, he's, he's my provider. These young children that you see, we brought a Christmas uh, uh, blessing to them this year. We were able to share these backpacks and each backpack had a toy and some sweets and a big bag of school supplies. And we distributed those and we used the, the Christmas story as an opportunity to outreach to these young people. And so many gave their lives to Christ. And we thank you for your partnership in that. It's through the, the partnership with the, the local church here and and your offerings go to be the hand of Jesus reaching out. Uh, it may be us that is giving it to him, but it is your hand that's reaching out in Africa to meet these needs and to help these people. And we thank you for your prayers and your support and your generosity. And we just bless you in the name of Jesus. And God bless. We so appreciate you, uh, Joe and Avril, and uh, we uh, understand that uh, living in this way, in a mission way, uh, doesn't preclude you from having your own struggles and your own needs, and so we want to continue to pray for them and pray for Joe and for his father, who is really struggling now with uh, end-of-life uh, time together, and so he's here so they can be together. So we pray for, for your family, and uh, can we together turn to the Lord in, in prayer? God, we thank you for uh, how you transform lives, how you transform hearts to serve you. Thank you for the Morrises and for the stories that they share of what you are doing in the world. We are so thankful to, that you're using them and that you're using us uh, as well as we partner with them to do these amazing things. For we are together brothers and sisters of the same body, the church of which you are the head. And so we, we humbly uh, give you thanks that you are the provider for all good gifts and good things. We thank you uh, for fortunate for this woman, Lord, uh, who is a dear child of yours, who didn't know it before, yet her name was fortunate. And through her struggles and through her uh, suffering, she came to know how fortunate she is because of your grace. And sometimes we're walking around and we're unaware of the, the fact that we're poisoned, the fact that we are walking in darkness or that we don't know the truth. And yet you, you pursue us still by your spirit and you bring us into opportunities to learn of your goodness, of your gospel, of your word. And through the work of this church, the work of our partners, we both can meet practical needs but also the most important need of, of knowing who you are and who you are through your word and gospel. 
So we thank you that we have that opportunity and, and that practical needs and the gospel go hand in hand together, that both are necessary. So we, uh, we, we're convicted by that word that says we cannot save ourselves, that there's nothing that we can do. There's not enough time for us to save ourselves, and that is true. And the good news is, Lord, you have done everything that we need by your life, your death on the cross, your resurrection, your ascension into glory, the sending of your spirit. Through all of the work you have done, we are part of what you are doing, that we have the opportunity to receive this gift of eternal life and salvation, that we could accept it and open it and, and each day walk with you, Jesus. So we thank you. We pray all of this in the holy name, the strong name of Jesus that is above all other names. Amen. Now, I uh, want to invite the kids to pay attention. I'm going to go get something. I'll be right back. But uh, I've got a special word that I want to share with you. And it's just right over here. Okay, good. I asked Pastor Andy not to touch this earlier, and he didn't touch it. Thank you. Because, you know, people, sometimes you tell them to do something, and then they do the opposite. It's called disobedience. Maybe you've experienced disobedience before in your life. Well, if you remember back to the story of when God made us in the creation story in Genesis, God made that world and then he made Adam and Eve and he made a garden. And in that garden, there was a beautiful tree and it was in the middle of the garden and that tree had fruit on it. And God told them, okay, you can eat from the fruit of any of the trees except that one. Can't, can't eat from that one. Well, you know, the, the, the serpent was there as a talking snake, which we should, should have maybe been a clue to Adam and Eve that maybe this wasn't a good idea. But he was talking to them and said, no, you can eat that fruit. It'll be cool. So we know that there was fruit. Sometimes uh, people think that it was an apple, right? So sometimes we'll, we'll, we'll see a picture, like we will in a little bit, of the tree that's in the garden and it's full with apples. But the Bible doesn't say it was an apple tree. It just says it had fruit. I wonder what you think the fruit tree was that was in the garden. So if you're in the chat there, you can maybe put what fruit you think it was. <clears throat> and uh, was it a grapefruit, otherwise known as a great fruit, right? I mean, they're really great. They grow all over the place here. Or maybe it was a banana tree. We love bananas. They're easy. They come with their own wrappers. And so those are really good. I kind of think it was a cutie tree. Cuties are just the best. Who thinks cuties are the best? They're so delicious. They're easy to peel. You don't need to, like, get an instrument to help you with it. It's just great. So it doesn't really matter, but that's just what I think. But here's the point of the story. The story is that <clears throat> because of what Adam had done in disobedience and Adam and Eve together, it meant all of us had to struggle because just like the serpent said, oh, you can do it, it was, it was a lie. And because of that disobedience, it's something that we call sin. It separated us from God. And it meant that we would someday die, and it meant that we would have to get sick, and that we wouldn't live forever with God in that garden. But the good news is that God sent Jesus into the world to reverse what happened with Adam. Sometimes Jesus is referred to as the second Adam, because all the things that Adam did that we suffer from, everyone in the world, Jesus went to the cross to die for our sins so that all that would be undone, that we could have a, a new relationship with God. So that he's the second Adam that makes a new way for us. His obedience, his goodness gets put onto us. And that's good news. Let's pray about that. God, we thank you how you show your love to us. We thank you that you are so good. And that even though we disobey sometimes, and even though we're told not to eat something, we want to do it. That you are there with us, helping us to do what is right. Because you've done what is right, and your spirit lives in us. Thank you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
may be seated as we prepare to reflect and offer our offerings for God's work. I want to thank you for participating in the work of South Africa, the work here in Tucson, God's gospel work that touches lives. For all of us in-person folks, we're not going to pass a tray, but by the doorways on your way out, there are boxes with slotses. If you're able to share in the offering, thank you. And for those of you online, thank you for your faithfulness and generosity in Christ's name. Let's reflect now as we listen to this music uh, and pray about how God calls us to be an offering. Lord, bless our gifts. You bless us so richly. Lord, help us now to return the blessings for your work of love in this world. Jesus, in and through you, we live and give and pray. Amen. Heavy to 
John and friends, way to nail it. A Zulu praise song from South Africa when our friends are here. Praise points. Amen. We see a hamba. We are singing. We are marching in the light of the Lord. Gosh. I know. Man. Amen. Thank you so much. Sorry, I get carried away. Ah. <laughs> uh. But we got to let it shine, this little light of mine in any language. That's our worship series in this new year, the month of January. Uh, we're, we're reflecting in God's Word how God's peace and presence can shine through our personalities, lives, cultures, and languages. Last week, Pastor Ken mentioned uh, about our church window series. So each Sunday, we're going to uh, just take a look at one of our sanctuary windows of multicolors and see how a window matches up with God's Scripture and aligns with our lives. Um, but before we look at our church, a, a church window today, I, I'd like to ask you about your window of life. How is your outlook? And is your window of life anything like this window? Yeah, you know, at first glance, if you just glance at it, you think, yeah, it's a window. Wrong, it's a trick. It's a mirror window. Right. And, and uh, with a mirror window, you can't see through it. You can only look at it. And while mirrors are helpful in many ways, um, the closer you look to a mirror, the closer your face gets to a mirror, the larger your image appears and it blocks out everything else. A mirror window is only a mirror. You can't see through it to some place or someone else who wants to love you and help you. And so speaking of looking through windows, Let's open up our Bibles and our projection Bible. And let's turn to Paul's letter to the Romans today. Chapter 5, he wants to give us vision about seeing in new ways. We pick up his teaching at verse 12. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people because all sinned, to be sure, sin was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not charged against anyone's account where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam 
to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command, as did Adam, who is a pattern of the one to come. But the gift is not like the trespass. For if the many died by the trespass of the one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? Nor can the gift of God be compared with the result of one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation. But the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. For if by the trespass of the one man death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? Consequently, just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. For just as through the disobedience of the one man the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man the many will be made righteous. The law was brought in so that the trespass might increase, but where sin increased, grace increased all the more. So that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. God, we thank you for this reading of your holy word. Help us now, please, Holy Spirit, for us to rely on you and to be led by you through faith. Amen. Houston, we've got a problem. It's isolation. It's being cut off. It's acting out in anger. We've been practicing social distancing, but have we been forgetting about spiritual distancing? Today's word from the Bible is about our problem, and it starts with apple right? But I'm not talking about the Apple Corporation. I'm talking about the Adam and Eve Corporation. Adam and Eve's legacy, which led to these inventions still in our lives today. I self, living in an estrangement from our Creator God, who meant us to live in wholesome health and love with him and with one another. And I self only leads to I lonely. Being disconnected from God means disconnection from others in our lives. It leads to a preoccupation with self that I like to call I focus. Pretty much living your life pretty much focused on me, myself, and I. Thank you very much which makes you estranged from even really being comfortable with who you are, how you've been made, and how you relate to the rest of this world. And that leads to I sick, the possibilities and realities of disease in this world, viruses that cause harm, even death, cells that can cruelly multiply in our bodies, which leads to I death. Termination of life and the reality of hell, which is an eternal separation from God, an eternal separation from what we need for meaning and relationship and for living, experiencing the love and peace we were meant to enjoy. In fact, this problem of self-absorption could cause me right now to say, yeah, I'm just going to stop and hang it. It's a pretty good apple. And Pete's got some more over here. I, I'm just going gonna, gonna to stop. I'm just going to enjoy this. Take care of myself. Which would lead to other problems. But no, there's a peace in me that pushes me forward. There's a purpose in me 
that transcends just taking care of me. This little light of mine, I need to let it shine. So do you. And friends, this story of shining God's peace begins here with our Northminster window in our sanctuary that depicts the real apple I'm talking about. It's a key story from our Bibles that says so much about our embedded problem. This window depicts the disobedience of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. First off, as Pastor Pete said, it's a story that tells us to beware of talking snakes. The snake asks Eve, did God really say you shouldn't eat from any tree in the garden? Notice how he expands it immediately. That's the core temptation. Is God really to be trusted? Does God really care for the best for you? God knows if you eat of it, you'll be like God. You'll know about good and evil. What a great perk that is. Go ahead, Eve. You won't really die. And, and friends, we have a window about this story in our sanctuary. Isn't that neat? Uh, I don't see anybody sitting too close to it right now, but you, know, you could sit there and think, huh, that's a story of, of how we disobey God. And it's true. You know, once there was a pastor who in worship spent too much time on his message telling his congregation how it was Eve who took the first bite and it was that first woman that caused this terrible condition for all of humanity. After the worship service was over, folks were filing out. This was a bygone era when they shook hands. This woman came by, an older woman in his church, and shook the pastor's hand with a vice-like grip that made him wince. And she said, Pastor, did you ever learn the phone number of the Garden of Eden? He goes, no. She says, it's Adam 812. <laughs> the Genesis story is our story. And it goes back to the Garden of Eden and friends, this statement is so true. Many a forbidden fruit has gotten people into bad jams. Dr. David Jeremiah tells a story about his neighborhood, how uh, his neighbors and residents were becoming very upset about reckless, fast driving through their neighborhood streets. And so they all got together and organized a signed petition asking the police to provide better enforcement with higher fines for speeders. The police responded. On their very first day of patrol, they immediately ticketed five drivers who were ignoring the speed limits. Those drivers were fuming. They were fuming because all five of them signed the petition. You know, we hate sin in others. Not so much ourselves. And so no, this tree is not just about Adam and Eve. It's about me and you. And it's not just about people out there, but also us in here. And while in this story we're tempted to focus on that apple, we should really look at the whole tree. Because friends, here's the deal with our family trees. We've got ancestry dot problem. Our tree has a problem going all the way back to Grandpa Adam and Grandma Eve. Humanity through the generations following Adam and Eve have experienced this separation syndrome that causes suffering, death. The Bible has a little word for it. It's sin. Which essentially means missing that mark of living for God in love and health, holiness and with ourselves. As the saying goes, Adam and Eve weren't able, so they started raising Cain. Right, right? Let me write that down. Okay. So one person's self-rebellion from God led to another, which led to another. And Adam and Eve's first generation of children is the first recorded murder right out of the story of the Garden of Eden. And so this trail of sin, self-absorption, is a problem that's embedded in each of us. It's, it's in the brokenness of God's creation. 
And it even causes us problems in talking about our problem. You know, it's been poignant for me as we've gone through the year 2020 with this health pandemic, how many of us, me included, have said we will get through this. But tragically, many won't. This virus is real. Lives have been lost. And sin, like a much more wide-ranging virus, continues to take its toll in everyday life. Alcoholism, addictions, crimes, dishonesty, selfishness, broken relationships, deathly self-focused living. Now we will get through this. The question is how? And we must hold on to hope But the question is, what's the basis of your hope? Is it just the new vaccines? Is it just wishful thinking in the goodness of humanity? Please. Is it still that old myth of better living through better education? That more informed people will behave better? You know, on Christmas morning, just weeks ago, we had a poignant picture of this problem of sin. An RV parked in downtown Nashville. Such a tragic picture. A person urgently warning people to get away, yet still so intent on ending his life and causing such damage. Two days ago as a church, we remember January 8th. uh, That incident at the Safeway store 10 years ago that tragically took the lives of six precious individuals. One of them, Phyllis Schneck, a member of our church. And others of our church were there and wounded and scarred from that event. And just three days ago, we witnessed an attack by our own citizens upon our U.S. Capitol building. An attack of passions out of control in which people felt incited and justified to trespass, to damage, to do violence, and lives were lost. And while these are extreme examples which seem to be right in our face, you know that every day we all struggle with fears, anxieties, hurts, loneliness, Addictions, betrayals, dishonesty, feelings of self-shame, feelings of unforgiveness, feelings of loneliness, isolation, despair, pain. And that leads us to our reading from the epistle to the Romans today. The Apostle Paul wants to give us hope, but he does so by helping us first see our direct connection with the old Adam. Having it your own way leads to death. Paul says, just as sin entered this world through one man and death through sin, and in this way, death came to all people because all sin. We share in this solidarity of sin. Reinhold Niebuhr, the theologian, once pointed out that the Christian doctrine of sin is the most self-evident doctrine we have. You could say our problem as a form of faith doctrine, our problem in a doctrine is called this, total depravity. Which means there's not one element of my life or my spirit or soul that doesn't have this element of selfishness or fracture in it. J.I. Packer, another theologian, teaches it this way. Total depravity means not that at every point man is as bad as he could be, but that at no point is he as good as he should be. Even in worship, even in our Christian acts of nobility and generosity, even then there's an element of selfishness or broken pursuit that's involved. You know, do I enjoy preaching on sin? No. But like you, I don't enjoy living with these harmful impurities in my life. Anybody here have a water filter on your refrigerator or in your refrigerator? Anybody have an oil filter or air filter in your car? Yeah. Anybody have locks on your doors? 
All those things are there to block out impurities that are harmful. You know, if you just look at a drop of water under a really good microscope, you'd be freaked out. It's like a little Reed Park Zoo in there. Oh, I'm telling you, there's little critters and canoes paddling around. They're spinning things that have more hair than I do. And you think, am I going to drink this? Yeah. Now, some of you might be thinking, whoa, Andy, are you feeling okay? Do you need to lie down? Did you not get enough of a Christmas break? Friends, it's, it's not that I'm down on humanity, but I'm down with this broken condition. And it sickens me. I'm tired of it seemingly driving light, driving life with a check engine light on. I'm tired of not being able to hug people, shake hands. I'm tired of people being stupid, people acting out in violent ways, people hurting, and that causes hurting people to hurt others. I'm tired of people not behaving in ways that contribute to the greater good. And while I'm at it, I'm tired of myself. I'm tired of all the ways I mess up and don't act in ways that could bless or help others when those opportunities are right there. Our condition of depravity means that embedded in each of us is this self-absorption problem called sin that leads to separation from God, from the life we were meant to live and enjoy in this world. And just as we live with love and many good things, we still continue to struggle. Cornelius Plantinga, another great theologian, has said, recalling and confessing our sin is like taking out the garbage. Once is not enough. And this is why in our Presbyterian tradition of worship, we regularly pray a prayer in the spirit of confession of sin. Here's why. Our confession of sin must be continual. Because look at us. The way to stay strong and pursue God's health is to see and admit our problems and to regularly turn over our faults as a way to grow in our faith. Admitting our foolishness to God is how we grow in Christian wisdom. Our confession of sin must be continual, but also confident because of Jesus. Confident that now in Jesus Christ, there is a new hope from our loving Heavenly Father, friends, who runs to take us back like prodigals every day into His arms of mercy. The focus of confessing our sins is not primarily to name the shame, but to name the mercy that gives us healing, new life. Our hope of rescue is only in God's saving grace, which is offered to us as a gift in Jesus. This is why Paul writes to us and asks us to compare Jesus with Adam. Think about these concepts. The old Adam brings us trespass, but the new Adam, Jesus, brings us gift. Adam's breaking with God damaged us all. Paul says, if by the trespass of the one man, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. This gift of Jesus is offered to all. And like a gift, it must be received to be enjoyed, to become realized. It's a gift we simply need to say yes to and live out with God's help. The old Adam brings us judgment. The new Adam, Jesus, offers us justification. We can now be made right, cleared of all charges, because Jesus paid our bill. Jesus' obedience to God's call of love displayed on that cross is what makes us right. As Paul says, just through the disobedience of the one man, many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, many will be made righteous. 
Friends, there is only one portal to acceptance with God, and it's the righteousness of Jesus Christ. The old Adam leads us to death. The new Adam, Jesus, gives us an identity of life. Have you ever stopped and asked yourself, what is God's desire for me? Why did Christmas happen? Why was Jesus of Nazareth given to this world? Paul sums it up in our reading today. Just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Life. God wants you to have an identity of life. You know, I started off with an apple, but can I close with windows? How are the windows of your life these days? How is your outlook? And have you been focusing a whole lot on your own reflection, your own anxieties, uh, your own fears? Or can you receive and fling open the shutters of God's window of grace given to us in His Son? Can we look at our Northminster window once more? There's an apple on the ground, which is a sign of our sin, but there's also still fruit on the tree. And Paul points out that even in this old story, we see the hope because this original Adam, he says, was a pattern of the one to come. Jesus was given to be the offer of renewed fruit. The one who would say, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. This window depicts our problem, but even the remaining fruit on the tree reminds us of our cross here on the wall, depicted artfully in the shape of vine and branches. Jesus invites us to become engrafted into his vine of renewed life. Friends, is Jesus the taproot of your family tree? your identity? Have you accepted this gift of grace in Jesus? You can't just inherit Christianity from your grandmother or that godly friend of yours. It's like a gift under Christ's tree, the giving tree, with your name on it. But it's not yours until you say yes and open it, receive it, live it, Celebrate it. William Willimon, the writer, tells a story of his friend who has served as a chaplain in a state prison. Years ago, he received a letter from a father of a young man in that prison. His son had committed armed robbery and was going to serve many years there. He was an angry, embittered young man. The father came almost every week to visit him, but every week the boy refused to see his dad. The chaplain was asked to intervene, to plead with the boy, to see his father. Every week the young man said no. Week after week, the father took time off work, got a bus ticket, rode across the state to, with the hope of seeing his son. And every week the chaplain would come and ask the prisoner, do you wanna see your dad? And then the chaplain would bear the bad news to the father. One day after telling the father once again that his son did not want to see him, the chaplain emotionally burst out, no one would do what you're doing. Your son is an embittered, defiant young man. Go back home, get on with your life. No one would put up with this kind of rejection week after week. Nobody would do this. The father quietly picked up his meager belongings and his bus ticket, and he looked at the chaplain, pointing upwards, and he said, he has put up with it for centuries. Do you want to see your heavenly father? Do you want to look out a new window today and see someone who's been longing to love you, to show you a way out.
Someone who even suffered and died to clear your name. Someone who rose again even from death so that you can live now and forever in God's love. I'm going to now pray. And I invite you to silently join with me in prayer. This is a prayer to say yes to this gift. Dear Jesus, thank you for giving your life for me. Today, I want to give my life to you. I am inviting you, Jesus, into my life. I admit that I am a sinner in need of a Savior. I want to follow you, Jesus, from this day forward. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and give me the strength to be the person of God you're calling me to be. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amazing grace. Friends, is it the gift of God in your life? 
I want you to know that if any of you prayed that prayer to open and receive that gift today for the first time, would you just let Pastor Pete and myself know? And you can do so by just letting just a comment on that communication card. Uh, we'd love to just pray for you and encourage you in any way that we can. And let us all go on our way rejoicing, living that gift of forgiveness, new life, and allow it to shape our choices, our patterns of living, our way of living love for others. May the blessings of God the Father, the grace of his ever-living Son, Jesus the Christ, and may the power and the peace of God's Holy Spirit be with you and keep you today and into eternity. Amen. Thank you.